Good morning and welcome to the NAHL Group PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all the questions submitted today and publish responses when it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to the CEO, James Serralis. Good morning to you, sir. Thank you, Alessandro, and good morning, everyone. I'm James Serralis. I'm the CEO of NAHL Group, and I'd like to welcome you all to NAHL's preliminary results presentation. This covers our last financial year, which was the 31st December 2023. Now, we released our prelims on the 2nd of May, and we're going to talk you through those results today and highlight the progress that we've made across the group last year. So with me here today is Chris Hyam, the group's CFO, and we're going to talk through the presentation, which is also available on the investor section of our website. That's www.nahlgroupplc.co.uk. Today's agenda should be on your screen now. I'll start today by giving you a flavor of the highlights for the year. And for those of you who are new to the business, I'll give you a short introduction into what the business does. I'll then hand over to Chris to present more detail on our financial performance and to talk about our progress in reducing net debt. Then we'll dive into a review of each of the two trading divisions and finish with an outlook. Um, as Alessandro said, there should be plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, so if you do want to submit a question, then please do so, and we'll try and answer as many as we can. Uh, if we don't get to any, uh, if we don't get to all of them, um, then we'll we'll try and submit a written response, which will be added to the meeting on the platform for you to view later. So let's crack on and get into the highlights for the last year. In 2023, we continued building on the group's strong foundations. Despite the challenging macroeconomic environment, cost inflation and high interest rates, we grew our revenues and earnings, and we made a significant reduction to our net debt. The highlights are on your screen now. Our revenue was up 2% to 42.2 million, with growth in continuing operations in both divisions. Our PBT was up 14% and continuing earnings per share up 13%, excluding the results of our small conveyance in business, Homewood Legal, which we sold in the year. You'll see a theme in the results today of growing cash generation with free cash flow 64% up in the year, driven by strong performances from across the business. In particular, in our own integrated law firm, National Accident Law, uh, cash from settlements was up 73%. That helped us to strengthen our balance sheet, and we reduced net debt by 27% in the year, from 13.3 million at the end of 2022 to 9.7 million at the end of 2023. Sitting behind those results are further improvements in consumer legal services, and in particular, our personal injury business, which was again profitable and cash generative. You'll see shortly that NAL has continued to rapidly scale and we're continuing to invest in building the book of claims. We're getting very close to a mature business in NAL now, and you can see the step change that we've achieved in the last year in the growth in claims settled, 92% more in 2023 than the prior year. That's great news for our customers and great news for us as it drives the cash generation I mentioned a moment ago. Also in consumer legal services, we disposed of a small non-core conveyance in business, Homewood Legal, in April 2023, which removed a drag on our profits and allowed the management team to focus on our strategic priorities. In critical care, the business delivered double-digit growth in revenues and profits. And as planned, we saw significant margin expansion as a result of our past investments in people, business development, and systems. These investments, as well as the work we've done to develop our expert witness and care propositions, have created a highly profitable business with a strong track record of growth and a platform for future success. Overall, then, I'm pleased to report that the group continued to make strong progress in 2023, and these results give me confidence that the group is on track to deliver significant growth that the market expects over the next couple of years. So those are the highlights from 2023. And before I expand on them in more detail, this is the point where I usually take a step back. And for those of you who aren't familiar with our business, provide a brief introduction into who we are. 
NAHL is the UK's leading personal injury law firm and rehab business, helping people who've had an accident or suffered med medical negligence that wasn't their fault to get their lives back on track. In our 30 year history, we've helped over a million customers access over a billion pounds in compensation by providing legal support and rehabilitation services. We provide services and products to individuals and businesses through our two divisions, which we call consumer legal services and critical care. In consumer legal services, we're one of the UK's leading providers of personal injury advice, services and support. Last year, we celebrated our 30th anniversary, so we've got a strong heritage in this market. And in that time, we've helped more people injured in accidents in the UK than anyone else. Through our market leading brand, National Accident Helpline, we guide accident victims through the steps of making a personal injury claim. We triage those claims, and for those that we think have legal merit, we either pass them to one of our panel of specialist third-party law firms, or to one of our joint ventures for processing, or increasingly process these claims in our own fully integrated law firm, National Accident Law. Distributing claims to our panel provides us access to quick profit and cash flow, with firms typically paying in 30 days. However, if we process those claims ourselves in National Accident Law, then we achieve higher levels of profit, but with a longer working capital cycle, as these claims take on average two to three years to process, and we get the cash right at the end. The joint venture helps us to balance those two extremes. <coughs> Also in this division, we operate a small property searches business called Searches UK. Now in critical care, our Bush & Co business is a market leader in expert witness reports, initial, initial needs assessments and case management rehabilitation services in the UK. We support children, young people and adults following a catastrophic injury or clinical negligence. And these are the most serious injuries, often leading to life changing disabilities and include injuries like acquired brain injuries and spinal cord injuries. And claim settlements exceed half a million pounds and usually run into the millions. We also, also launched a new care proposition in 2021, which is growing rapidly and offers nurse led care management solutions for accident victims, generally after a claim is settled. So those are our two trading divisions, and we also have a centralized shared services division, which provides strategic leadership, funding and governance to support our growth. Over the years, we've built an inclusive and supportive employee culture with a strong focus on engagement, which helps us to re recruit and retain top talent from across the UK. And we're proud to have been recognized externally for this culture, having been awarded the gold standard by investors and people, and included in the best small companies list in recent years. So hopefully you should now have a good overview of who we are <coughs> and the progress that we made last year. And I'd now like to hand over to Chris, who's gonna take us through a review of the financial results for 2023. Chris. Thank you, James. Um, I'll start with an overview of the PL. Um, so as James touched on, we've, we grew our revenues by 2% to 42.2 million in the year. Revenue was actually up 4% on a continuing basis. In consumer legal services, revenue was 2% lower at 27.6 million, but actually grew 1% on a continuing basis. And the critical care business had a strong year, growing revenues by 11% to 14.6 million. Operating profit at 4.1 million was 0.6 million lower than last year, but there was also a reduction in non-controlling interest from our joint ventures, which fell by 1 million. On a net basis, profits grew. Operating profit from our consumer legal services business was 1.4 million lower in the year, as our law firm NAL continues to build towards maturity, and we spent three million pounds on generating eight and a half thousand new inquiries to be placed into the law firm. Critical care delivered strong growth, increasing operating profits by one million to 4.4 million. And despite our debt levels falling quite materially in the year, rising interest rates meant that our interest costs rose to one million, um, three, uh, 0.3 million higher than last year. This all resulted in a PBT growing to 650K, 14% higher than last year, and continuing EPS up 13%. Uh, just to drill into the chart and into the detail a little more behind the revenue. So this, this chart illustrates the key movements that we've seen in revenue across both our divisions. In consumer legal services, I've already highlighted the revenues are up 1% overall. Uh, but the underlying story is one where the law firm grew revenues by 48%, as more cases settle whilst older, often more valuable litigated cases are also now starting to settle more frequently. Revenue from the panel and products was broadly flat, 
and revenues from our joint ventures fell as the book of cases that those that the joint ventures are working on become smaller. Revenue in Searches UK also fell due to difficult conditions in the housing market. In critical care, the one and a half million or 11% growth we saw in, in revenue was driven by the expert witness side of the business, which grew its revenues by 1.7 million or 38%. Case management was around 200K lower uh, than 2022, offsetting some of that gain. And we'll come on to the, the reasons behind that in a future slide. From a profit, profit perspective, I mentioned earlier that we'd seen a large reduction in non-controlling interest in the year, and you can see the impact of that on the two boxes above the, above the chart. In 2022, operating profit net of non-controlling interest was 1.2 million, but this grew by 34% to 1.6 million in 2023. This was expected as the joint ventures reduced in size and NAL continues to mature and, and takes over that balance uh, of, of where our work is going. The consumer legal services division also remained profitable and we continued as we continue to invest in new cases. This is further illustrated on the chart by 122% or 1.6 million increase in profits from the law firm whereas operating profits in the joint ventures fell by around 1.4 million. After offsetting the non-controlling interest, the net reduction in the JVs was around 0.4 million. Panel products and marketing fell as more RTA inquiries are generated and placed with NAL, whilst more marketing costs also increased slightly. Profits in critical care grew by 29% as investments in, in business development and people begin to pay back. Uh, alongside this, we controlled our overheads, which resulted in a 400 bips improvement in operating profit margin for the critical care business, growing it, growing it to 30%. And from a cash perspective, um, we had a strong year on cash. We generated a free cash flow of 3.6 million. This was 1.4 million or 64% higher than last year and subsequently reduced our net debt by 27% from 13.3 million to 9.7 million. This was ahead of the market expectation. Our operating cash conversion was 217% compared to 143% in 2022. The personal, in personal injury business was again self-funding, generating 1.6 million of operating cash after payments made to LLP members, and cash collections from settled cases in the law firm continued to grow, increasing by 73% to 6 million in the year. In critical care, we, we invested in additional credit control resource to drive cash collection, and this, along with the growth in profit, helped us generate 4.9 million in operating cash from the business. This was 61% higher than last year, uh, an operating cash conversion of 111%. Interest payments were 0.5 million higher than last year as interest rates rose. Um, and since, since, finally, on, since, the, since the year end, we've extended our groups, the group's banking facilities with Clydesdale Bank, Strict Virgin Money. Um, and this now runs through to December 2025. With debt levels falling, we also took the opportunity to reduce the facility from 20 million to 15 million to reduce costs further. Uh, and the interest rate has remained, remained constant at 2.25% above Sonia. Thanks, Chris. Uh, next, uh, let's dive into a bit more detail on the performance of our two divisions, and we'll start with consumer legal services. So our consumer legal services division performed well in 2023 and continues to outperform the market as we focus on building a sustainable, higher margin business. The division is dominated by our personal injury business, where we operate in the UK claimant side personal injury market, which we estimate to be uh, worth around a billion pounds. Over the past five years, uh, we've built a fully integrated law firm, National Accident Law, or NAL for short, uh, which is fit for the future and capable of scaling to generate higher returns for shareholders and great outcomes for our customers. As I said, we're building a more sustainable and profitable business by using our marketing, uh, market leading brand, uh, National Accident Helpline, to help as many accident victims as we can, uh, by processing more of those claims <coughs> in NL for higher returns, and by funding our growth through cash generated from claim settlements, our panel relationships, and our joint ventures. And over the next few slides, I'm going to draw out some of the good progress that we've made with this strategy in the year. Now, the headlines that Chris just went through for personal injury business um, are revenues for personal injury up by 3%. Operating profits exceeded our expectations, but were lower than last year as we invested more in growing NAL. Uh, but that will pay back in future years. And as the business has been cash generative uh, for the past two years, that really proves that the model works. 
So those are the those are the headlines. Let's take a look uh, at some of the operational results from the different elements of the personal injury business. So first of all, I'd like to focus on National Accident Helpline, which is the first point of contact with our customers. Now, last year, according to the Claims Compensation Recovery Unit of the Ministry of Justice, the number of personal injury claims uh, in the UK fell by 3%, and that was driven by a 5% decrease in road traffic accident or RTA claims. If we look at employer's liability, public liability, both of those are what we refer to as non-RTA, um, along with clinical negligence claims, well, they all went up. Um, they increased by 2%, 11%, and 3% respectively. And you can see from the chart on the bottom right of this page, the majority of our work is in non-RTA claims. So whilst the trend in the market overall is down, our focus areas are seeing some growth. And it's a large market, like I said, we estimate it to be over a billion pounds. So there's lots and lots to go at. I said earlier that our first strategic priority in personal injury was to grow the number of accident victims that we support, and we successfully achieved that goal in 2023, growing the number of inquiries that we generated by 2% to 35,643 inquiries. This resulted in us growing our market share by 8%. In the RTA market, we've a relatively small share of the market, as most claims are captured by insurers, but we grew our share from 1.5% to 1.9%. And this is the highest level that we've enjoyed since the government's whiplash reforms were implemented in 2021. Our share of the non-RTA market, excluding industrial disease claims, which we don't accept, held broadly level at 17%. We invested half a million pounds in brand building through TV advertising in the first half of the year. And whilst that generated a positive return on our investment, market conditions were such that we thought we could generate a better return through focusing more on social media which we did in the second half. Overall, though, we spent 2% more in marketing in 2023 than we did in 2022. Our brand continues to be a leader in the market. An independent research carried out last year identified National Accident Helpline as the first choice for people who've had an accident and want legal representation. That's something we're very proud of. If we look a bit more, if we look in a bit more detail at the 35,000 inquiries that we generated, the mix of claims shifted for the first time in a few years in favor of RTA work. Now, since early 2021, we haven't been processing the lowest uh, value of RTA work. Um, and so our mix has gradually been becoming more and more profitable, which is good news. And this is something that I mentioned six months ago. Um, and the challenge that presented itself uh, to us in the first half of 2023 was that we had more RTA work than we planned to come in. And we didn't have an outlet for it on the panel. And as a result of that short-term challenge, we placed all of that work into NAL, which will generate a good return when it settles. But we had to wait to book the profit and cash benefits from that until later in the claim cycle. As a result, our short-term profit in cash um, in the first half of 23 was slightly lower than we planned on these claims. And we had less capacity to take non-RTA work into NAL whilst this was happening. Now, we've overcome that challenge by staffing up. Uh, to process that work, and also by signing up a new panel member to take a small share of our RTA work. And that's helped us to achieve a better balance and to start to process some more non-RTA work in NAL. So in the grand scheme of things, the mix change isn't too bad a thing, so we can process um, that work in NAL, and our RTA work is, is more or less as valuable mm -hmm. as non-RTA now. Um, it also tends to settle a bit quicker as well, as so it's less complicated. So overall, a good year for National Accent Helpline with growth in market share, strong brand recognition, while supporting a growing number of accident victims. Next, uh, I wanted uh, to, next I said, we wanted to grow the value of claims that we were processing in NEL, and, and Chris is going to give us uh, an update on how we did that. Thanks, James. And um, so we've, we've included this chart in the last few updates, and it's, uh, it's an important chart for us in terms of tracking the, the, the growing maturity of the law firm as cases progress. Um, so for those who haven't seen this before, the, the, the pink bar, the pink bars on the chart, they, they represent the expected revenue and cash to be generated from the inquiries that we would place it into the into an AL in that particular year. Um, the grey bar alongside it shows the amount of cash that we are collecting in a given year. Um, so the two, the, the, the cash doesn't match up in terms of timings with the with, with, with the, when the cases go in. But what you'd see if volume stayed flat, um, 
if, if volumes into the law firm stay flat on an ongoing basis, at the point at which the grade bar equalizes with the with, with the value of the new cases going in is the point really where the, where the law firm met, met its maturity or reached maturity. Um, you can see that in particular in 2023. So in 2023, we placed 8,518 new inquiries into the law firm and we expected those to generate a, a future revenue and cash of 6.6 .6 million. At the same time, we generated 6 million of cash um, from cases that settled from previous cohorts. This was two and a half two, two and a half million pounds higher than it was last year, and you can see the gap now is only 0, uh, 0.6 lower than the than the future value of the case cash going in, in in that year. And this increase in cash was driven by um, as a result of 3,633 claims settling in the year. That was that was 92% higher than than previously. Um, and this is really a, about the life cycle of the cases catching up now. Um, these cases have a, a kind of anywhere between a two to four year kind of gestation period in terms of when they're going to settle. Um, and the law firm has been going since 2019 and we're reaching that kind of level of maturity now. In addition to this, we revalued re our estimates on what we believe the cases to be worth. Um, when we published our interim results in September, we put through a 1.6 million increase due to the performance of older, older cohorts exceeding our expectations. We've since increased this further um, by, by 0.5 million to reflect the recent Rabo versus the Sam Supreme Court ruling, um, which ruled on in March 2024. We need to see how those cases progress now that the ruling is in place, um, but we'd hope to see some upside on this figure as well. This takes the total revaluation to date to 2.3 million, and at the end of the year, we had just under 10,000 cases ongoing, which are expected to generate 9.9 .9 million of future revenue, 8.6 million of future gross profit, and 13.9 million of future cash. If I take that a step further and just look at one of the one of the cohorts in in more detail, so if I look at the most mature cohort we have, which is 2019. Um, so in that in that year, we placed 2,415 new inquiries into the law firm, and we expected those inquiries to generate future revenue and cash of 2.3 million. If I fast forward to 2023, <clears throat> we now know that we've collected 2.9 million in cash from those inquiries, and we still have 183 claims ongoing. As a result, we further upgraded our estimates for the 2019 cohort to 3.1 million, meaning an 0.8 million uplift overall, um, and we still have 0.2 million of cash still to come. What this proves is the model works. We've been proven in our assumptions historically, and this gives us a lot of confidence as we continue to invest in cases to grow the law firm in the future. We've included similar charts for other cohorts within the appendices of the presentation, of the presentation should you wish to look at them. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, the final element of our strategy was to ensure that the personal injury business continued to fund its own growth by carefully leveraging its agile and scalable placement model. This is where we balance the work placed with our panel, our joint ventures, and NAL, each having their own working capital cycle and profitability. Remember, the panel offers us lower profits per inquiry, but quick cash. NAL is higher profits, but longer cash cycle, which could be two to three years on average, and the JVs are a, a balance of the two. Well, I'm pleased to report that the business generated 1.6 million of positive cash flow in 2023, despite the continued investment we put into NAL. The cash return from our joint venture partnerships was 33% up in the year, um, as these operations are now mature and performing well. Since the end of 2021, we've been running off one of our joint ventures, Your Law, as we look to move more work into NAL to generate higher returns. Um, and this should be largely complete, this runoff, uh, by the end of 2024. We'll continue to pass inquiries into our newest joint venture, Law Together, as it's performing really well. Uh, we have a great partnership with HCC solicitors in that, in that joint venture, and we really like the flexibility that this arrangement provides us with. So over the next few years, we expect cash from joint ventures to reduce to a smaller but still important part of the total. But to offset that, we're seeing significant growth in cash from NAL, which was up 73% in the year with the book continuing to grow. So overall, we expect cash generation across the personal injury business to increase. Next, let's turn to our other division, critical care. Now, as we highlighted, Bush & Co had a very strong year, growing revenues by 11% and operating profits by 29%. The business also generated 4.9 million pounds of cash. Our strategy in this business is to focus on three areas in order to continue our strong growth trajectory. 
Firstly, we wanted to grow share by appealing to a broader customer base. And we've seen a step change in this area over the past few years as we've been invested in more marketing campaigns and growing our business development team. This continued in 2023, and we benefited from a 4% increase in new inquiries, which is our pipeline of future work and very strong customer advocacy scores. Secondly, we wanted to extend our competencies and specialisms, meaning the services that we offer and the markets that we operate in. Again, we had a strong year uh, with continued growth in Bush and Co Care Solutions and further recruitment of highly skilled associates with growth of 22% in both the number of expert witness and case management associates that we work with. And finally, we wanted to become more efficient in what we do, and we made good progress here too. We grew our operating uh, profit margin by 400 basis points to 30%. Uh, we upgraded our back office systems and we reduced manual intervention um, and invested in more credit control resources. actually. That helped us deliver a 61% increase in cash from operations. So what we're going to do next is look at each of these service lines in turn. Expert Witness had a record year in 2023, growing its revenue um, by 37% and continuing its growth. In Expert Witness Services, we earn revenue by being appointed to a case by a solicitor. Um, we then visit the client to do an assessment and we submit a report. And occasionally there'll be follow-up work, such as amendments to the report and also potentially giving evidence in court. Now, the team delivered 1,136 expert witness reports to our customers. That was 70% more than last year. We saw growth in average revenues, and there was more demand for follow-on work from our solicitor customers. And pleasingly, we continued to build a healthy pipeline of new instructions, which were up 9% on prior year. And I mentioned customer advocacy on the last slide. Well, you can't get better results than that. 100% of our customers would instruct us again and 100% overall satisfaction in the year. So a really fantastic year from the team in Expert Witness Services, and uh, they're looking to build on that performance in 2024. Next, if we look at case management, well, our revenues were slightly down year on year, but what's really pleasing is that our client numbers remain robust. Around half of critical care revenues are recurring, and most of those come through case management, so it's a really important metric. And within case management, we earn revenue in two ways. So firstly, by issuing uh, an initial needs assessment report, or an INA. Uh, this is where we visit the client not long after the accident, we conduct an assessment of their condition, and we make recommendations on the rehab that they require. And the business delivered 539 INAs in 2023, which was 2% more than the previous year. Secondly, we sign uh, many of these INA customers up to ongoing case management, and we grew the number of ongoing clients by 4% in 2023. This bodes well for the future, as this is our recurring revenue that we build monthly for the support that we provide and where we typically support customers for around three years as their recovery from the accident or medical negligence progresses. Instruction numbers remain robust. Uh, the number generated in 2023 was 5% lower than prior year, but this is against the backdrop of an exceptional 2022 when INA instructions grew by 14%, so I'm not overly concerned about that. Now, case management services across the market have changed a lot since the coronavirus pandemic. Prior to that, almost all meetings, both with the client and their care teams, were face-to-face. -face. And what that meant was that billings for meeting time and travel were a lot higher. The pandemic forced us all to go online, and certain meetings are now held by video conference, which is much more efficient and better for the client, much better value for the client. Um, but it also leads to lower billings for Bush & Co. And one of the ways that we're addressing this is through our team of employed case managers. Develop, um, and these, this team is capable of delivering the same first class case management service for our clients as, as we do with our associates, but by delivering them through an in-house team that allows us to better control resource levels and that should help us to generate higher margins. Now we grew the team from seven at the start of 2023 to nine by the end of the year. And whilst we're still subscale and it's still early days, I'm really optimistic for the future of this initiative. 
Now, last but by no means least within our critical care division uh, is Bush & Co Care Solutions, which was launched in 2021 and has been rapidly scaling since. This proposition provides a support and management service for employing care staff. And you can see on the table on the right hand side of this page some of the services that we can perform for our clients. This not only complements our existing case management service, but it attracts standalone work and opens up a new adjacent market for us to expand into. Revenues for this service were up 39% in the year to about half a million pounds, and it won't be long before this business is breaking through the million pound barrier. Its growth is driven by the number of standalone care packages that it delivered during the year, and that grew by over 100%. Each one of these is recurring revenue, filled monthly and largely paid out of settled funds. This service is regulated by the Care Quality Commission and in December 2023, it was our turn for an inspection by the CQC and I'm pleased to say that it went very well. The team were rated good by the inspector and had no areas for improvement. So a clean bill of health and an exciting opportunity to grow this business further over the coming years. So before we move on to questions, and I can see we've got quite a few questions come in, I'll just summarize. Over the past few years, NAHL has demonstrated its ability to scale and outperform its markets in both of its divisions. In 2023, we increased revenues and earnings across the group, and we made further progress with our strategy, growing the number, um, the value of claims uh, processed in NAL to create a more sustainable and profitable business, disposing of our non-core conveyancing business, which has become loss-making. And in critical care, we've created a platform for growth with new systems, a new care proposition, and enhanced business development capability that will allow us to win market share and expand into adjacent markets. We've also significantly reduced our net debt from a peak of over 21 million in 2019 to under 9.7 million at 31st of December, 2023, strengthening our balance sheet. We remain on track to deliver against our strategy in 2024. In the first quarter, we continued to scale NAL. The business settled 26% more claims than in the equivalent period last year. And that led to us generating 2 million pounds of cash from settlement, 67% more than prior year. That's 2 million pounds in quarter one compared to 6 million pounds for the whole of last year. In National Accident Helpline, well, we reduced the number of inquiries we generated in Q1 to match a 30% reduction in demand from our panel, but we protected our investment in NAL. Pleasingly, in order to generate these inquiries, we spent 45% less in marketing than last year, meaning the average cost of acquisition of an inquiry was lower and we were more efficient in our marketing and conversion, which is encouraging. Since the end of Q1, we're seeing demand returning and we're increasing our spend to grow inquiries in response. In critical care, the trends we saw in 2023 have continued with growth in expert witness, case management being largely flat and rapid growth continuing in care solutions. Chris mentioned earlier that since the end of the year, we've extended our banking facilities to the end of 2025. And we also saw the judgment in the Supreme Court go in the favor of the claimants in Rabo versus Hassan case. Now, this is an important judgment that affects our small claims RTA work in NAL, and it should result in higher average damages paid out to customers, quicker settlement timescales, and higher average revenues for NAL. So we're really keen to see how this pans out in the second half of this year, but certainly a positive for the business. Finally, you may have seen that the board issued an announcement at the start of April that uh, it was considering a possible sale of Bush & Co. I can't really say much more about this at this stage uh, because it's very early in the process and there could be no certainty that it will lead to a transaction. But we're always looking at strategic options that accelerate growth and value for our shareholders. And we felt that now was a good time to evaluate this option. Finally, then just to reiterate, as a board, we're confident that we're on track to deliver in 2024 and we should see significant growth in profits and further reduction in net debt as the business matures. So that brings the formal uh, presentation to an end. Chris and I are very happy to take questions, but for the moment, I'm gonna hand back to Alessandro. 
James, Chris, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated in the top right corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions that have been submitted today, I'd like to remind you that the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you can see, we have received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. And James, Chris, if I could just ask you to read out those questions and give responses if it's appropriate to do so, I'll pick up to me at the end. Yes, thanks, Alexandro. Um, so we'll we'll start. Um, th there are quite a few questions that are that are quite similar, actually. So I'll try to group them together and give you uh, one answer. Um, so the first one uh, is about Bush and Co. Following on from the announcement about the potential sale of Bush and Co., could you share any more regarding the rationale for a sale now and the progress that you've made? Um, there's also a question: Could you provide more information about the proposed Bush and Co. sale? Uh, what's the rationale? What would the proceeds be used for? Is returning capital to shareholders an option? Um, and are there any others that are similar? Uh, yeah, uh, if Bush and Cohen sold, would the consumer legal services business earn a profit in net free cash flow as a standalone business? So let me try and answer those uh, questions in, in one go. Um, as I said a moment ago, there's really not a huge amount more I can say about the potential sale of Bush & Co. at the moment. I truly believe that it, there's a great opportunity for Bush & Co., um, not just to continue its growth, but to accelerate its growth and dominate its market for many years to come. This obviously creates a lot of value for our shareholders. And the question that we're exploring at the moment is what's the best way of unlocking that value? Is it through a sale of the business or by investing further capital into it ourselves? Um, it's a really important decision, obviously, and it's not something that we're going to do on the side of our desk. So we've engaged advisors to lead a process, and um, I expect interest from multiple parties. Uh, once we've completed that process, we'll carefully evaluate all the offers and we'll consider what option uh, provides the best value for our shareholders. But I want to be clear, this is not, this is not a forced sale, um, but I think now is a really great time to consider this option because we're coming off the back of a really strong year. Uh, we've started 2024 well. We've created a platform business that, it's, that, that is in the best shape it's ever been in. And there are signs that the market is ready to consolidate. I also think it would have been quite risky to try and sell Bush & Co 12, 18 months ago, um, as our personal injury business wasn't ready. Um, that business is now profitable, it's cash generative, and it's growing fast. With regards to progress that we've made, um, we said just a few weeks ago, we're at the early stages of this process, um, and, and, and that hasn't really changed. Um, as a result of the announcement that we put out, we did receive several expressions of interest, but we're not yet in, in uh, discussions with buyers. We're preparing for that phase soon. Um, but as I said, we will do this in a way to get the best possible offer, um, and then we'll take it from there. As for the proceeds, well, we'll set out our plans to investors in due course, but I can assure you that we're considering all of our options. So hopefully that answers uh, those questions um, as far as I can. Um, next, there was a question. Uh, you mentioned the Rabo versus Hassam legal case in the Supreme Court being beneficial for the business. Could you add any details so that I can understand its significance? Uh, Chris, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so the, yeah, the Rabbit, Rabbit versus Hassam case, it essentially upheld a ruling by the Court of Appeal on, on mixed injury small claims. Um, a mixed injury small claims are those where there is essentially more than one injury as a result of an RTA accident, and specifically where one of those injuries was uh, whiplash or soft tissue related. Typically, um, when, when, when you have a mixed injury claim, you, you add the value of the two injuries together and you apply a discount for, for what's called overlap. Um, to use round numbers, it might be that you have two different injuries, each valued at £2,000 of general damages, and you might agree to settle the offer at £3,000 after applying the overlap. In the Rabo case, it was complicated by the fact that one of the injuries was a soft tissue tariff injury. Now, these, these tariff amounts can be as low as £250. So using that same example, if, if, you had the tariff, if you had the tariff of £250 and the second injury was again valued at £2,000, um, the offer on the combined amount would be £2,250 before any overlap. And the offers that we were receiving from the, from the defendant insurers were, were being discounted to a figure lower than the, the value of the single highest injury, so essentially lower than £2,000 in this example. 
And what the Rabo ruling has essentially done is address that by stating that the offer can't be lower than the single value of the, the single highest value of the, at any injury but as part of the claim. Um, and why, why this is important to us is that a number of claims have been held up across, P, across the PI industry as, as we've been awaiting the outcome of this ruling. So there's a bit of a backlog there in terms of cases waiting to be settled, not just us, but, but across the market. Um, and this ruling should now allow these cases to progress to settlement, hopefully for the for the, now the fair amount for the for the customer, uh, in line with the with the case ruling. And in time, we'd hope this would lead to quick quicker settlement once that backlog is cleared. Just for some context on our book, um, around 40% of the RTA inquiries that we process are mixed injury small claims, so they'll be impacted uh, positively by the, by this change. Um, our revenue on these cases is entirely linked to the damages value of the claim when it settles, so that, that's why this is important. Um, and although these are the lower end of the of the scale in terms of the damages and therefore the revenues that we make, this was still an important important ruling for us and our customers. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, we've got another question here about Bush and Co. Um, the rumored the rumored price tag for Bush makes it obvious the market undervalues NAHL, assigning essentially zero value to the PI division. Uh, why then not just sell the entire company? Um, uh, would it make sense to keep the NHL stub listed after a bush sale? Um, yeah, and 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 if we were going to go down that route, why not wait until um, NHL cash flow improves to get a better valuation? So a number of points there, some of which I, I think I've probably covered off. Um, I think it remains to be seen what the true valuation of Bush and Co is, but I can understand the point that on a sum of parts valuation, the market appears to be undervaluing personal injury. Um, business, which is really frustrating. Um, one of the benefits of this process that we're going to we, we've kicked off now is that it really should prove this point, and I would hope that the market would recognise that. With regard to what's happened after a sale, um, which of course we can't guarantee that they, this will lead to a sale. Um, well, I said we'd set that out for shareholders in due course, um, and I think we can we can come back and discuss that then. So I'm not really going to speculate on on. Um, on, on a potential outcome, just to say that we're evaluating all of our options um, and, and we'll set that out um, if and when we get to a point where a transaction's on the table. So next uh, question um, is around the general trajectory for profits paid out to non-controlling interests. Will they continue to decrease? Um, are you working towards fully winding down those joint ventures? Uh, and uh, and then there's another question around Bush and Co um, being a uh, sorry I've just lost it a second uh, should Bush and Co be sold would there be any point continuing to be a listed company um, so I think Chris do you want to have a go at the um, the non controlling interest point um, first sure sure um, so hopefully you've seen from what we presented so far that the the non controlling interest through the through the PNL is coming down. Um, this is this is largely a result of the of the your law uh, joint venture, which is which is in runoff as, as James pointed to earlier on. Um, and 2024 should see see the most of most of those remaining cases in in your law um, come to a conclusion. Uh, we do continue to place inquiries into the law together joint venture uh, again, as we as we pointed out earlier on, albeit they are at lower volume than than compared to what we've we've placed with your law historically. Um, and, it, and that joint venture continues to perform well. It continues to play an important role for us in managing our working capital and, and placement decisions. Um, I touched on earlier on that the, the life cycle on cases can be anywhere between two to four years. Um, and that's true of the Law Together um, joint venture as well, uh, particularly as, as, as the work placed in that joint venture is, is non-RTA in nature, which tends to be the longer the longer term cases. Um, so there'll be there'll be a runoff on your on, on law together of around three to four years from the point that the last inquiry goes into in, into that joint venture. But at the moment, as I said, we're still we're still placing inquiries in, in into it. Um, so there will be there will be non-controlling interests um, related to the joint ventures for some time to come uh, as a result of that. Albeit again on a reducing basis from where they've been historically. And if I look at the if I, if I, if I steer to the Allenby forecast that. Um, that have been put out in the market uh, alongside our results. Um, so non-controlling interest in 2023 was two and a half million. Um, the analyst has that forecast to come down to 1.6 million in 2024 and reduce further again to, to 900K in, in 2025 um, as, that, as that runoff kind of, that, run, that runoff concludes within your law uh, and we bed into a new level uh, within law together. 
Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, we've got several more questions left to go. I think we've got time. So um, thanks very much. We really appreciate your engagement um, in this. Uh, so the next one is about something completely different. Um, there seems to be a wide gap between the quality of customer reviews in National Accident Law versus National Accident Helpline. What are you getting wrong in the customer experience or process at National Accident Law and how are you plan on fixing those issues? That's a good question. Um, I think it is fair to say that the, if you look at the customer reviews for National Accident Helpline, they are, I think they are excellent. And if you look at those for National Accident Law, we've got some way to go to get to that level. And there are a number of reasons for that. Firstly, I'd say there's quite a big difference between the service that we perform in the helpline and the law firm. So in the helpline, we typically spend around 45 minutes with the customer and we can provide a resolution at the end of that time. That means either connecting them with a the solicitor, explaining that their accident doesn't have legal merit or explaining their options for what they can do next. But in the law firm, it's a much more complicated process. The vast majority of our complaints actually um, are either due to the time it takes for a customer's claim to settle or communications. I mean, that, that makes up over 90% of the, 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 the comments we get back. Unfortunately, claims can take years to progress um, and there's two sides to every claim with the defendant often trying to defend their position and frustrate our clients. And so it's more difficult for us to delight our customers in the same way. But we're settling more claims all the time um, we mentioned earlier on, this was up 92% in 2023, and we continue to, to scale. With regards to communications, well, I'd say over the past four or five years, we've created a new law firm from scratch, and we've definitely experienced growing pains in the past. And there are times when we could have done things better. Uh, hope, hold my hands up to that. Many of the negative reviews come from our small claims customers, and when we take those claims on, we do so on the basis that all communications will be electronic because we've said in the past that, that that's the efficient way to, to manage those claims that are that are generating relatively low revenues. Um, <clears throat> but our customers often get frustrated further down the line when they can't call us. So that, that's a bit of a challenge that we deal with. And we track not just formal complaints, but also minor um, expressions of dissatisfaction from customers. And these are reducing month on month. So things, are clearly improving and we can see that in the numbers but there's more for us to do <coughs> excuse me in particular i think we need to get better at asking customers to add a review when they've had good service um, and a good outcome and we're talking to our teams about that so improvements are being made um, but there's more to do uh, this is definitely a focus area for us so thanks for your question um next question uh Uh, how will the recent change to social media marketing impact future inquiry generation and what return on investment is expected compared to traditional TV advertising? Well, I think they're, I think they're slightly different um, approaches to, to marketing. So we did invest half a million pounds in TV advertising in the first half of, of 2023. That was really more about brand building and, and, and investment for the future. Um, and it did return uh, a positive return on investment, um, but it's TV advertising is very expensive compared to other other forms um, of advertising. Um, the other end of the spectrum, I suppose, is is pay per click. We do a lot of pay per click, um, and that's very efficient and a very effective sort of direct um, response uh, approach. Social media is probably a blend of the two, um, and it's it's more effective than TV brand building, we expect to see a higher return on investment. And, and we have seen that and we've seen, uh, we saw growth last year in inquiry numbers. Um, but it's difficult, it's really difficult to quantify the full impact of TV. So um, we're constantly managing these things. This is, you know, this is what we've done over the past 30 years. Um, I don't think that we'll, we'll be investing heavily in TV um, over the next 12 months. Um, it kind of depends on market conditions. We felt like we were a bit of a sole Voice on TV uh, was actually as one of the uh, the leading brands out there. We benefit from when others advertise on TV as well. Um, so uh, there's a lot going on in this area. We're trying different things, but the good news is in in the first quarter of the year I mentioned earlier on, um, our marketing is becoming more efficient. Um, so inquiry numbers were 
were down 30% in the first quarter, but actually our marketing costs were down 45%. So um, we're making progress uh, and we'll constantly uh, evaluate and adapt our, our approach to suit market conditions. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, Chris, I don't know if you want to take a, a punt at the next one. Uh, uh, this one says, what proportion of revenue growth is expected from recurring revenues versus one-time sources, particularly in critical care um, division, given the growing emphasis on recurring business models? Yeah, sure. So the um, <clears throat> well, the rec recurring business across the group is is really in the in the critical care business. So we're around around half um, of our of our 2023 revenues were. Uh, from re recurring recurring revenues, and those recurring revenues are primarily in the in, in the um, in the case management and care side of the business. Um, yeah, the, the the life cycles on on a case management case can be two to three years that we'll be working with a customer, and that's that's monthly revenue that we're we're we're, we're building through through that process. And on the care side, um, that's that's a, that's a new revenue stream for us, but the, that has the potential to have an even longer case life cycle than. Than, than the case management side of the business, so um, it could even extend to whole life care in, in theory. Um, but we need to, we're, we're a couple of years into that. We need to see how that kind of plays through. Um, but so far, that that revenue has been recurring on a consistent basis, um, and just continues to grow as we add new volume um, in, into the hopper. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so uh, we've got one more question. Um, I think we've got time to squeeze it in. Um, can you give us some more color around the earnings power of the consumer legal services business as a standalone entity? If you look at that business on its own, what should it be earning this year and next as a standalone business on a free cash flow basis after payments to LLPs? <clears throat> yeah, so um, I mean, I'll, I'll sort of point you to the numbers that are in the in the market uh, at the moment. So if you go um, to our broker Allenby, they have some research out in the market and you can um, link to that from our website and download their research for free. It's very helpful. Um, if you look at the consumer legal services division as per their research and you take off the payments to, the, to uh, LLP members, the profits this year in 2023 were 0.3 million pounds. And we've said that's, that's due to rapidly scale over the next couple of years as NAL Comes mature. So in 2024, the expectation net of uh, non controlling interest is 2.4 million pounds, so 0.3 to 2.4. And then that goes up in 2025 to 4.3. So you can see the scale of that growth um, of, of the consumer legal services uh, business there. Um, and I think there's probably more to come after that in 2026. It's probably not quite um, mature. There's a little bit more still to flow through. Um, so that's that's the sort of the the run rate that we're going at at the moment. Um, if 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 we were to uh, complete a transaction of Bush and Co. And, and there's obviously no guarantee of that, then we would look to set out our our plans for the future um, for NAL, which may include some further investment, particularly now that we've proven the model. I think the charts that Chris talked through earlier on about the performance of the book in NAL really really important metrics there. And that really demonstrates that that it does work. Um, that the the cases are high value, uh, good value cases coming through, um, and we're settling those, and they're returning uh, positive cash flows as well. And 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 Chris talked about the closing book, the level of revenues and profits and cash we expect from that. So I think um, we we've, we've developed a good um, growth engine in NAL, um, and and the question I think now comes. What, is, what does that investment um, plan look like for the future? And that's something that we will set out um, as and when uh, we present a potential transaction for Bush & Co. Uh, we do have some uh, shared services costs um, in there as well. You can see that from the research and, and that's partly a function um, of being a listed business. So there, there is a fixed cost element there. Um, if we were a smaller business in the future, we would look to make some savings in those costs, but an element of that is fixed if we're on the market. Um, we are evaluating all options um, and, and, and we'll look at what delivers best value for shareholders, but um, I can't really speculate too much now into what each individual option looks like. Um, so I think hopefully that's something we'll come back and talk about uh, more as the process develops in the future. 
Uh, perfect. James, Chris, what I might do is I might just jump in there and thank you for answering those questions for investors. And of course, the company can review all the questions submitted today and we'll publish those responses on the Invest in Me company platform. But just before redirecting investors, provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company. James, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Yes, thanks, Alessandro. And I'd also like to thank all the attendees for joining Chris and I today for NAHL's preliminary results for 2023. I'm pleased with the solid financial performance that NAHL has delivered last year, and I'm encouraged that we continue to outperform the market in both consumer legal services and critical care, whilst further reducing net debt and investing in both businesses to build a more sustainable business. So thank you again. Perfect. James, Chris, thank you once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will then take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of NAHL Group PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.